Pro climbers are not like the rest of us. They're better, way better. And it's easy to attribute that to more and better training or perhaps genetics. But there is something else at play here. Some things that are learnable yet really discussed. And that's what this video is about. To understand what that is, we first need to understand where the pro comes from. You know that young kid who rocks up on day one and sends a V4 and within six months is sending V5, sixes, sevens. And then you, who's been climbing for years but still struggles on those same V4s that he flashed on day one. That kid goes on to be a pro. And you, like everyone else, just goes on to be a regular climber. Or give up in frustration at others' speedy progress or your own plateaus. And it's so easy just to say it's genes or luck or whatever, but I don't believe this narrative and you shouldn't either. I personally change my own progression trajectory and do the same with my clients. There are other real tangible things at play here that can be changed that pros never talk about. These are biomechanical and postural factors, literally where our body is in space, its anatomical position, and which muscles we're using to support it at any given time. And Magnus, or any other pro, aren't going to be able to tell you these things because they've mostly been doing them pretty right since day one. It's so natural to them that it's invisible. They can't talk about what they've never had to learn. And so now, to get into the meat of it, I'll break down the most important things that you and pros do differently and how to change them. First, a 15 second anatomy refresh. Your arm is basically a stick that attaches into a shoulder blade, which then attaches onto the torso. The arm can move in the shoulder blade joint without the shoulder blade joint moving, and the shoulder blade joint can move on the torso without the arm moving, or they can both happen at the same time. So point one, pros tend to use the shoulder blades to move their arms whenever possible, and regular Joes just move their arms. These two movements are very different with very different results, so let's break this down. Your arm and the muscles on it is not particularly strong. Your bicep is a fairly weak, fairly disadvantaged muscle. Your triceps similarly aren't amazing. The real power in moving the arm comes from moving the shoulder blade relative to the torso. This gives you access to the lats, pecs, traps, serratus anterior, rhomboids, large powerful muscles that attach to the shoulder blade or basically right next to it. This is what that looks like. Here the arm is being raised without much accompanying shoulder blade elevation, protraction or rotation. It's just an arm going up. Obviously the shoulder blade is moving a little bit, but much more of this movement is happening from the arm and being driven by deltoids and weaker arm muscles. Here the arm movement is much more about shoulder blade movement. It rotates, elevates and protracts. The second movement gives you much more access to those big boy muscles I was talking about before. You can now recruit all of those large muscles which have been lengthened and use them to pull you up the wall. Now, in reality, you can't just use shoulder blade muscles or arm muscles. Realistically, you're gonna use both. But it's about the effective recruitment of both groups and the relative distribution of activation. And not only are these shoulder blade muscles much more powerful, but they're also allowing for much more stable and controlled and precise movement of the arm. This gives professional climbers much of their distinctive look when climbing. If you see Magnus climbing with his shirt off compared to a regular Joe, they look very, very different. Magnus's shoulder blade movements are significantly more dynamic, larger, and frequent than what the average person is doing. This functional range of motion plus connection through this range of motion is one of the things that makes pros so good. Okay, cool. How do you do that then, you may ask? Two of the factors I'll discuss today are the influences of your center of gravity and your resting torso and spine position. Torso position heavily influences shoulder blade movements, particularly how round you rest through your torso and how round you stay through your torso as you move your shoulder blades. In particular, I'd like to focus on shoulder blade movement up the body. It's a combination of a bunch of different movements, elevation, protraction, and rotation. And if we look at someone like Magnus doing this, he looks almost superhuman in terms of the range of motion he's getting in these movements. And one of the most common errors I see in regular people doing this type of movement comes particularly in the protraction and rotation elements of it. And this is often in part due to their poor torso position. Now, rotation and protraction work together in these overhead movements, but for this first part, I'll focus mainly on the protraction element of it. And this is when that bottom corner of the shoulder blade swoops around the torso. And this is a super important movement in climbing. In these examples, in both instances, the shoulder blades are moving round and forward on the body. Yet these two movements are very different. One is a collapse and one is a contraction. The one is a collapse because as the shoulder blades move forward, the rib cage moves backwards at the same time. This counter movement of the chest to the shoulder blades is actually negating the action of a lot of the important muscles. Look at the pec and serratus anterior. See how floppy they are? They aren't being used in this movement. They're just being collapsed into. Remember what I said earlier? 
the shoulder blades attach onto the torso. If the torso and shoulder blades move in the opposite direction at the same time, they negate the action. In the other example, the chest stays round as the shoulder blades move forward. And this gives a very noticeable strong pec and serratus anterior action. Guess which of these two is more functional in climbing. In one of these examples, you're gonna have access to your pecs and serratus when you need them to do the next movement. And in the other, you're gonna have neither. And one really easy way to see if this applies to you is to look at your own pec muscle development. In particular, at the upper chest area, but just in general, are they well developed? Is one smaller than the other? If one in particular is underdeveloped, it's very likely that this is the side you collapse through more in the upper rib cage area or as the shoulder blade retracts. So one of the first steps to actually learning this is to ensure that your rib cage stays round enough as you protract your shoulder blades to keep an action in the pec and serratus muscles to give you muscular shoulder blade protraction as opposed to just collapse traction. One important thing that goes along with this or helps achieve this is keeping your belt line relatively flat and your abdominal muscles engaged as you try and breathe and round in your rib cage. Just flaring at the bottom of your rib cage and leaning back isn't actually going to change your entire rib cage position. It's just leaning back. Your actual rib cage shape is unchanged. And another key element of this is thoracic spine position. Where your spine naturally rests determines a lot of shoulder blade position and function. And this is because your spine shape influences rib cage position. If you constantly rest with an upper spine that is forward, your rib cage will get compressed underneath that and your shoulder blades will rest on that compressed rib cage shape. The shoulder blade position is being influenced by the spine position. And if you stay in this position long enough, your pec minor muscle that goes from your shoulder blade head to the front of your chest will get super tight and overactive and basically be on all the time. And this will cause your shoulder blades to sit forward and down and around on your body. And when you go to do a protraction movement, that is the way that they will like to protract. This top corner of the shoulder blade will move around the body much too much. And so when people are told to move the bottom corner out, they'll often bring that top corner along for the ride and have much too much forward roll in their shoulders through the movement. This shoulder blade protraction with the bottom corner coming around, but without the top corner coming around too much is super important in so much of climbing. Basically because in climbing, your arms are out to the side of you 24 seven. And every time if this is happening, you're bringing along that unnecessary forward movement in the shoulder blades from the tight pec minor, it's really going to impede performance for a lot of reasons. You're going to excessively stretch out a lot of those lower trapped muscles, and you're going to negatively impact both pec and serratus action. As the shoulder blades roll forward, the top of the pec isn't going to activate well, which is why you typically see that pec development with the lower being developed without the upper. And this is going to make you much less effectively recruit those shoulder blade muscles you need for climbing well. This particular shoulder blade movement is a super important skill that you need to practice all the time because it's one of the bedrocks, the foundations of climbing style movements. Try and practice moving that bottom corner around without the top one coming forward. Think about it like a bodybuilder pose where you're trying to flare your lats and look ridiculous. It's very similar to that movement and then just moving your arms up from there. Another way you can try and do this is by completely protracting the shoulder blades forward, collapsing, but then trying to just bring the back top corner back rather than the whole thing. It can also be really helpful to have a friend put their finger on the bottom corner of the shoulder blade so you can feel where it is as you move it in space and better understand what it's doing relative to the rest of your body. Something else that's really important for protraction movements of the shoulder blade, but also rotation, is where your center of gravity rests. Many shoulder blade muscles also work as stabilizers as you transfer weight between your two feet, like in walking or running or anything else. And if when you rest, your weight is either too far left or right, these same muscles that stabilize alternatingly as you move can get caught holding on. For instance, if your weight is too left, your right shoulder blade can get stuck holding on as if you're in the middle of a left gait stride. It's work holding on to this asymmetrical weight distribution will prevent it from moving properly when it's needed. It'll get stuck. And this is a much bigger deal than people realize. And it's really easy to test. Just film yourself from the back with your shirt off, lifting both your arms above your head. Look at which of your shoulder blades move higher. The one that moves higher is your less stuck one. The one that stays lower is your more stuck one. And this will be just as stuck when you're climbing or doing any other movement, and it will really influence which arm you reach with. Most people when climbing have a strong preference for either reaching with a left or right arm, depending which shoulder blade moves up more easily. So like in this example, if your right shoulder blade is more stuck, you're gonna prefer reaching up for holds with your left arm. Fixing this is about centralizing your weight in standing and really understanding what weight centrality means as a felt experience. Practice this by just transferring weight onto the lighter of your feet. If you're not sure which one is lighter, it's often the one that you'll kick a ball with because that's one that's easy to come off the ground. And it's also really important when doing this to keep your weight forward on your feet, not letting it go back, and keeping your abs on and belt line flat. 
Once you've done this adjustment to check if you've got it correct, film yourself from the back again and see if you're able to move that shoulder blade up higher more. If it hasn't worked, it's likely the weight transfer hasn't worked well. Once you get a hang of this, practice doing it in progressively more complex situations and understand what it means to have that shoulder blade moving freely. Look at the difference between these two. With this example here, all the weight on the left foot is preventing that right shoulder blade moving up. As the weight centralizer gets more right, that right shoulder blade suddenly frees up and is able to move more easily overhead. Okay, so next factor. There's another really important concept in climbing called maintaining tension. And this basically means moving with connection, having your muscles on, not just letting bits of your body fall places. And this is especially important in climbing as having bits of you falling pieces will create unnecessary momentum and often pull you off the wall. And even if these aren't big obvious movements, even micro falls, internal slight losses of tension, are often enough to make you lose your position. And this is especially important because of those extra unwanted forces that micro falls create. Even if you don't actually fall, but the weight of your torso sags in an unexpected direction, this can cause you to fall or compromise the climb or position in some other way. This is especially obvious when you watch beginners who aren't very good at moving climb. They'll constantly have limbs flailing and flagging all over the place, creating all kinds of unnecessary and unhelpful force vectors that are basically just pulling them off the wall willy-nilly. But even mid-level climbers do the same thing, it's just much less extreme and obvious. So how do you better maintain this connection, this tension, as you climb? And there is no simple one answer to this, because each individual will have variation in where they themselves are better at holding or not holding tension, but there are some universal principles at play. In general, people are not good at using the muscles that they don't use well in other contexts. So the abdominals typically tend to turn off a lot more than they should in a lot more situations. Their eccentric and concentric loading as you arrive and transition between positions is essential for maintaining control throughout the movement. You can see my video called How to Be Good at Parkour for more info on this concept where I go into this in a little more detail. But basically, you need to be keeping all of your muscles working the right amount at the right level of tension for the movement you're trying to do. So as an easy example of this, if we were lowering our legs from an elevated position, we could do this in a number of different ways. We could let them fall and build up a whole bunch of disruptive momentum, and this would be just by turning our abdominals off and letting gravity take over and bring our legs down. Or we could eccentrically control this movement with our abdominals and hip flexors, allowing them to lengthen but still control the momentum as our legs descend. This would ensure that there's no extra unwanted momentum building up, pulling us off the wall. For a harder example, we could think about a dynamic jumping movement to the side. As you arrive at the hold that you've jumped to, you need to immediately counter the momentum that's trying to pull you off. And you'll need to shorten and hold tension much more on the side of the body that would keep your legs in relative to the other to keep you in place. And the better that you can control your position appropriately, you can better maintain your position in space. And this ability to appropriately control the tension has a lot to do with the balance of tension in your body already. Basically, if you're out of whack and you're holding tension in all kinds of strange places all the time, you're going to make it really hard to use that tension effectively. And again, center of gravity is one of the biggest influencing factors in this. As we transition left and right, as we move, we're swapping the tension. But if we sit non-centrally, it means we sit with more tension on one side. A lot of our muscles will be shorter and working more than they need to be a lot of the time. And a lot of the other ones will be more stretched with less weight in them than they need, creating both a mix of too floppy and too tight muscles, which I'm sure, as you can imagine, is not ideal when you're trying to control that tension in a movement. So again, centralizing this in simple context is key and understanding how you aren't central. So this is again about coming back to the feeling of weight on your feet. Where does your center of gravity rest? One of the most common locations is back on a left heel, especially if you're a right-hander. Getting that towards the right big toe and then feeling what that's doing to the tension in your body is a super important thing to understand. And last point, I think rock climbing is a really interesting and good sport to practice because it puts your body into what would typically be considered bad positions. And it does this often with large amounts of awkward rotation through limbs and strange weight distributions. This is just the nature of the sport. And the challenge is not going into bad positions, but maintaining good connection and weight distribution or as good as possible while you're doing this. And so in particular, climbers are going to struggle with movements that pull them in the direction of their weaknesses. So for instance, internal rotation movements are often going to cause a lot of trouble for people because they're going to get lost in that internal rotation. So in the arms, this internal rotation will look like a collapse through the pecs again, and you'll have a total loss of power and connection when you do this, as well as a lot of flexion movements in general, like the more bent people are going to get at their hips, the harder it's going to be for them to get out of that position because they're not good at recruiting their extensors often. And so being aware of your individual patterns and trying to maintain eccentric support in the appropriate antagonist muscle for the movement. So for instance, when entering into hip flexion movements, keeping your glutes active, feeling your muscle lengthen and work at the same time is the key feeling. And it's strange until you get it. 
And so to not just talk the talk, but to actually walk the walk a little, I started climbing. And to measure this in some way, my climbing gym has a leaderboard that allows you to track your progress with about 800 other registered climbers. And within six months of starting, I made it into the top 25 of my gym's leaderboard, climbing some V6s and 7s. Now this may at first glance look like I'm a natural, but I've actually tried climbing previously 10 plus years ago, and trust me, at that time, it was a disaster. I was aggressively mediocre at best, struggling to climb many V3s. And this progress many years later is not because I trained harder or more, but rather because I trained smarter. Since then, I've learned about bodies, about maintaining connection, and I'm much more able to effectively use my body. And this, I guess, is the point, is that understanding the principles of movement scales, trying harder does not. Anyway, that's all for this week. If you'd like to support my channel, you can buy me a bouquet of flowers, Timbits, or a custom set of Japanese cooking knives, whatever you feel is best. My Bitcoin link is down in the description if you so feel inspired. Thanks for watching. Peace out.